today we're going to talk about independent learning for exam classes. Um, so a little about me, but not too much because I've only got half an hour. Um, basically, I'm a teacher, I'm a tester, and I write materials for exam preparation. And when I was teaching, I really got into independent learning and I, I want to explain to you why and also how you can do it yourselves. Yeah, so I'm going to start, if that's okay, with a quote. And the quote is from Yates. Yeah, okay. And it is, education is not the filling of a pot, but the lighting of a fire. Okay. So I just thought this might get us reflecting on what teaching means can't a hear anything. little bit. I hear somebody in the background. We'll just try your speakers, maybe. I think um, you're coming through fine, Joe. That's fine. Okay. Carry on. Great. <laughs> so the quote, yeah, education is the filling of a pot, but well, not the filling of the pot, but the lighting of a fire. Um, what do you think? It's just a question to think about. Would you consider yourself more of a pot filler or a fire lighter? And what do you think teachers should be? I think perhaps we've all done a bit of both. And for me, I think the difference between these two things really hinges on independent learning and how we can foster it with our students. So the first thing I think we need is probably a, a definition of some kind. What is independent learning? So basically, it's having ownership, control over your own learning. And this involves many things, acting, thinking autonomously, but with guidance from the teacher where appropriate, and especially at lower levels, I would say. Making informed choices about what to learn and how to learn it. And taking on responsibility for learning. And we'll come back to these main points. But for me, there are three real key things about independent learning. And in the words of uh, Nottingham University, here we are. Now I've used a quote from a university too, because a lot of universities do talk about independent learning. Because in many universities, and especially in the UK, independent learning and having autonomy over your learning is expected. So it might seem like a good thing to do, have control over your own learning. But what do your students think about it? So just in the chat, if you can think of a, I know that students are, have many opinions and many things, but just type in a few things that your students might think when you say, let's do independent learning. Great ideas, <laughs> some great ideas there. Yeah, it's it's like jumping off a cliff sometimes, I think, for the students. They're like, what, what? Um, here are some ideas I made earlier, which are quite similar to some of yours, I think. Let me just put them on. What's independent learning? I don't know how to do it. I don't like it and I don't see why I should do it. I love learning by myself. No, obviously not everyone thinks that, but some people do. And lastly, my teacher should teach me everything I need to learn. Um, these are things that I either think my students might say or some things that my students have said. And I think it's especially the last, the last one, my teacher should teach me everything I need to learn. It's a lot of pressure on the teacher. And it's also impossible. You can't teach them everything they need to learn. 
And especially as we go through the levels, I think, and they expand in terms of vocabulary, in terms of language, in terms of skills. And as Fiona's going to mention later, later when she talks about advanced classes, we can't possibly teach them everything and neither should we really. So next, you guys, what do you think about independent learning? Again, in the chat, write your ideas. Be as honest as you like, don't worry, I won't get hurt. Yeah, a lot of different opinions on that. Again, yet again, here's one I made earlier. Um, let's see if any of these opinions are the same as what you think. Again, not really sure what it is. Not sure how to do it. It's too much to manage. I can't control what my students are learning. I should explain everything to my students or they won't feel I'm teaching them. These are all super valid concerns and especially the management. I think nobody wants to add a massive amount to their workload. Teachers already do enough as it is. Um, but my aim is to show you that it can be manageable. Students can see a difference and they will feel like they're learning. So hopefully that takes that last fear away a bit. Um, before I go into the how, I'm going to look at the pros and the cons. So basically the why of independent learning. I've already touched on a few of the pros already. So it can give learners useful skills for the future. We looked at that in terms of demands from university. But if you think about your students, I mean, they obviously, I would think generally want to be successful in the future, perhaps have a management position. Any management position involves having autonomy, making informed decisions. So these are skills we're building for them that they will take on into the future. It can build confidence in learners' own abilities. I think it can. And my argument here is that if you have a problem and you're not sure what to do, then you're never going to have the confidence. But if you're giving the, given the tools, to overcome your problems and feel like, look, I did this on my own, then hopefully you can be a little more confident about your learning. And the last one, which really is the major point of my whole talk, I think, is looking specifically at exam classes where we can make targeted improvements, not to the class, but to individuals. And I think this can be a real game changer in terms of an exam class. And I'm gonna explain what I mean by that. So what's the problem with exam classes? We already know they're fun and a delight to teach, but more than that, often they revolve around the skills because the majority of tests, especially the large tests are for skills exams. So you're looking at listening, speaking, reading and writing and when you're teaching for exam preparation, most of the books divide the time equally for that. So you'll have some time given to listening, some time for speaking, some for reading, some for writing, and then also language development. So vocabulary, grammar. And of course, this is generally what happens in many, many classes when you're teaching from a book. The problem with this is that it doesn't accurately reflect your students. Because you might find one student here is weaker at writing and actually a really good listener. And if we drill down into that, there are reasons they're weak at writing. So maybe it's their grammar. Maybe it's just syntax in general. Maybe it's their structuring. Is it their spelling? Yeah, but that student has their own problems. We look at the second student 
actually reading and writing is really good, but listening and speaking less so. And we can carry on and on and on. Here, for example, where we've got a class where we're dividing our teaching between skills equally, and we've got all these individual needs. And they're very, very difficult to cater for just in that classroom. And this is where independent learning can come in. So I think this can be really good, but again, there are downsides. And let's look at those as well. What are the cons? The students won't like it or won't do it. Hmm. It's a valid concern, concern, but let's look at this in a bit more depth. Okay, we've got some guy looking over a cliff. It's scary. Independent learning can feel like you're jumping off a cliff, you're doing something you've not done before, but it doesn't need to be. Support them, structure it. Tell them what it means. Tell them how it helps. Tell them how they will do it. Doesn't sound quite so independent, but we're moving them forwards to that, yeah? Ensure that you are there to guide and support them. You may have a student like the one in the bottom right. They can't be bothered. Okay, if they can't be bothered, again, we've got to kind of reason with them. Tell them it is specific to their needs. And also tell them that it can help their score. And also make sure they're accountable for their own learning. And we're going to look at that in a little bit more depth later with an example. Let's look at the next con. It's difficult for teachers to set up and manage. As I mentioned before, nobody wants a, a massive load of work to do that's extra to their normal workload. So what can we do about that? Okay, we need to organize it and we need to restrict it. I think when we look at successful independent learning, it's down to just making sure our organization and structure is there at the beginning and something that we can manage and carry on. So don't create work by sending students to find out their own resources. I think perhaps maybe we've all sometimes done that in the past with a class we shouldn't have and it turns into mayhem, yep. So guide them into the resources they can use. Give a specific time to discuss what they've done and where to go next. Keep a record of their progress. Get them to recommend resources to each other. And the most important thing, if it's new to your class, don't start with fireworks and the whole show. Start small and then you can add to it in time. Yeah. So don't do everything at once. Just start with some small steps. And the last negative, there aren't suitable resources for students to use. Well, there are suitable resources, and this is where we should guide them. Here we have them. There's a load of resources, and I, I know that some of these are few in mind, but other books are available. <laughs> um, there are loads of self-study resources out there. There are excellent websites as well, and these are all books that are for self-study that you can see on this page. They're from different publishers, but they cover the things that are absolutely essential for self-study. They have answer keys and they have explanations. And when you're studying your own, that's essential. They're good quality as well. Use these resources. I don't know here if anyone has ever tried to write, for example, an IELTS reading or anything like that, but it's extremely difficult. It takes days to do it well, and then it goes through two lots of edits. So use that material. Don't try and create your own in this case. Yeah, it's there as an aid to you. Get material that is also explicit to exam improvement. So you can find self-study, grammar, vocab books. These can be super useful, 
but also there are lots of books out there that have specific question type study. So the one I'm probably most familiar with, which is the Collins series there, those listening books have question types that are particularly studied and strategies for those question types and skills you might need for those. So as I mentioned before, any books like that, but you guys are the expert, you're the teachers. So look through those materials before you start this self-study and think about how valuable you think they are. Okay, so these are our requirements really for learners and what our resources should be like. So now let's look at a scenario. Here's the scenario. Nina's the teacher. I'll give you a, a couple of minutes to just read that. Okay, so when you've read it, I'm just going to have a minute of reflection. Put yourself in the shoes of Nina. Imagine that's your class and imagine you want to introduce independent learning. You've got, you've listened to the beginning of this talk. You've kind of, you kind of know why it might be useful. So in your head, and you don't need to write in the chat, this is just for you now. I want you to just think for a minute, what would you do? What would you do? Okay, so maybe you have some ideas now. <clears throat> Let's have a look at an example that I've done and which is one that is very similar to what I did when I started off. So she makes a habit firstly of writing on their homework areas of improvement. Now this doesn't have to be homework, it could be classwork. It could be noticing the issues that some students have compared to others. So in this, in this picture here, we can see that it's a, the student has written something and the teacher has done an asterisk with future tenses. So they think that student has an issue with future tenses. But this could equally be a, a listening test they've done where on the completion questions, they've got them wrong because their spelling is incorrect. And then that asterisk would be there that says spelling. Or it could be on a true, false, not given, where that student is particularly poor at that question, or a matching question, for example. And then it would say that. Or perhaps it's their speaking. They've heard them in class and they want to say giving ideas or structuring your speech. Yeah. So the teacher now is noticing students' areas from improvement from the material they're getting in, but also from activities they're doing in class. Now, why is this important, I wonder? And I'm, I want to use us all as language learners here because I'm sure like, probably the majority of you have also learned another language. And the worst thing about learning a language sometimes when you're in pre-intermediate, intermediate, is you don't know what you do wrong and you want to get better, but nobody's said to you, it's exactly this. 
this is the thing that stops you from getting onto that next level. And as the teacher, you are the key that can unlock that for the student. You are the person, you are the expert who knows what their most intrusive problems may be in terms of the exam. So you can help them with that. And it just starts with some little notes of key things. You don't need to write a lot. You need to make the point. Future tenses, spelling, true, false, not given. Just little things like that. You're writing next to your students' work, okay? Then Nina puts a list together of resources that she thinks are good quality that have keys or when it comes to perhaps speaking models, yeah? And all the students have access to that resource list. And one useful thing you can do here also is include, for example, a contents page on that so that they can see exactly what's in those books if they need to, okay? Now that is the bit of admin, but it's a one-time admin, yeah? It, it, it's not every week, it's not all the time. You might wanna refresh it sometimes, but it's just there as a static thing, yeah? So she's got these two things. She started off, great. What does she do next? Well, she decides on Fridays, that's going to be her independent study catch-up day. And in the first class, she asks students to look at their homework and note down two areas that they need to improve. Now that teacher could note down more areas and the students need to decide which two they want to work on. If you want to restrict it, you know, you can just mark down two areas for each student, it's also fine. And again, at the beginning, structure it clearly, do it in class. She tells students to look at that class resource list, find something that could help them. And this does need monitoring. Check with them, yeah, I think that will help you. Yeah, you can do this. So you're having problems with true, false, not given. In this book, you can practice this exercise, that kind of thing. So they're finding out themselves, but you are aiding them that first time. And then, she tells them to work on these areas in their own time during the week and be ready to talk about what they did next Friday. And she gives them a self-study record to keep and bring to the Friday classes. And I know what you're thinking, red alert, this is more admin. It's not more admin, okay? It's a simple table. You print out once, give it to them, keep it online. You don't have to do anything more with that. And this is what it could look like. Ooh, here. And here's one I did earlier. So again, you've got the week. You don't have to complete this. They can complete that. You've got two areas to improve in the second column. And you've got the resources they're going to use. So here we've got four bullet points, an indication that they should look at four resources, two for each problem area, yeah? Next to that, they've got scores. Now where applicable, if they can score the work they've done, they will be able to see their progress or not. Yeah. And in the last column, we've got a reflection. So what did they get out of it? How do they feel about their future tenses now they've done it? So here, I think my future is getting better. I still need more practice on reading true, false, not given. Just short sentences to say, you know, was it good or did you have problems? Okay, in next Friday's class, she asks the students to get out those records and discuss them in groups. And in those groups, they talk about those four things, every single week the same, what did they do? So what did they need to improve? What did they do? How well do, did they do? And what do they need to do next? And here they're starting to become more independent as they reflect on their scores and they decide if actually they can move on or if they still need more practice. Yeah. And this then becomes a pattern that is repeated every single week where they look at asterisks, they decide to move on, they continue to practice and the students then get used to it. And it doesn't need to take much of that Friday class. Of course, the first time, you might dedicate half an hour to setting it up, maybe more if it's very lower level. But then after that, it can be 
15 minutes, 10 minutes at the start of a class, something short where they're reflecting, they're thinking about their own abilities, what they've done, if they're getting better, how they're getting better, okay? Now, what are the benefits of this? I think there are quite a few benefits of it. I've seen improvements in my own students. Of course, some are more diligent than others, but that is also life, yeah? But there's raised awareness, there's improvement, and there is personalization, which is so hard to get into a group class. And finally, I'd like to go back to some of the definitions that we started with. These are the questions the students are now asking. What should I focus on this week? How can I improve that? Do I need to do more work on this? Are my scores good enough? What am I going to talk about in class in my group? Should I be doing more? And what do those things do? They're giving autonomy. They're making informed choices and their learning responsibility, okay? And that's the first step, as we mentioned earlier, on independent learning. Now, that was, was just one scenario because uh, it's 27 minutes past and I've only got half an hour. And it was a kind of a lower level one because I wanted just to give an example or a, a, a blueprint for a, a kind of a first way into it. Now, some of you might already do this, in which case, I, you know, I, I hope I have confirmed your beliefs or your actions. And some of you might be thinking about doing it. And if you are, great. Have a reflect on what steps could you do to create a bit more independent learning? You know, would you like to try it? Why? Why not? I think those questions are, are for you to think on about. And lastly, I'd like to say thank you for listening. Um, I have an AI picture there grasping technology myself, independent learning. Um, here we've got a picture of a pot filler and a fire lighter, because in my view, I think a teacher has to be both. <laughs>